bright duty. Every student matters. Now let us look at Sufis. Now who were Sufis? In the medieval Islam, there emerged a religious minded group known as Sufis. So Sufis within the Muslim community was a group of another community who called themselves Sufis. Okay. And what did they propagate? They aimed to gain a deeper and more personal knowledge and relationship with God through asceticism and through mysticism okay not through prayers and chanting and doing namaz okay they had they uh, developed their own understanding of how to develop a deeper and personal relationship with god okay the term sufi is derived from the word safa or purity implying that a sufi is one of the god's elect who had who has been purified of all worldly evils so sufi is derived from the word safa which means pure and sufi hence is a pure person who is elected selected by god okay and is purified of all worldly evils okay the basic ideas of sufism are to be found in the quran and the traditions of prophet muhammad so how sufis derive their ideas is also from quran the knowledge that they acquire from quran and also the traditions of prophet muhammad the teachings the principles the life of prophet muhammad the sufis accept the quran as the holy word of god they accept the quran as the holy word of god and uh, to this, however, okay, what what is different about Sufis is that they to the word of uh, God or the holy word of God, which is Quran, they give a mystic interpretation. How they interpret Quran is different. Okay, they give a mystic interpretation. Uh, the Sufis hold that God is one. They also believe God is one and his creation, which means whole, human soul, soul must be united with its maker. And they believe that the humans, uh, the human soul, the human soul and its maker, it needs to be united. Okay. Unity. Unity with God can be achieved only through intense love for God or Ishq, which a woman, Saint Rahia of Basra, preaches in her poems. An Iranian Sufi, Payafit Bistami, was the first to teach the importance of submerging the self in God. Okay, so the Sufi saints uh, and the uh, the Sufi, according to the Sufi idea, what they say is that the unity or this union between the God and uh, and us, okay, and the people, that can happen only if only if intense love for God can be expressed. Okay, so by expressing one's intense love for God, the the person can be unified. The person can come in unity with God. Okay. So one has to completely submerge uh, oneself in God. Okay. Of course, Sufism has firm faith. It believes in non-violence and pacifism. It believes in peace, harmony. Okay. The Sufi saints, the saints of this belief, they preached love of mankind and universal brotherhood. Everybody is equal and everybody, uh, everybody needs to love one another, one another. All right. They stressed the importance of a religious guide. So it was important. They said it is important to have a leader. OK, who can help us, who can teach us how to communicate with God, how to come in union with God. OK, and singing and dancing were regarded by Sufis as methods of stimulating love and passion to come in union with God. OK, one has to completely submerge in love with God. OK, so in order to come to that position, one has to uh, submerge or one has to participate in singing and dancing to stimulate 
uh, emotions to stimulate passion and love and that will bring close that will bring a person closer to uh, closer to god or in union with god okay now even this sufis there were different orders or there, there were different schools and these schools were called silsilas okay so that uh, silsilas uh, they were different schools where the sufi saints belonged to just like the different uh, schools of islam right uh, there were also different uh, schools of sufi sufism where the sufi saints belonged to and preached according to that school all right now let us look at uh, the culture of the arab empire the Muslim civilization provided the basis for the development of higher culture during 7th to 12th centuries. So there was development of higher culture during the or in a, uh, during the Arab Empire. Okay. Now, one of the reasons for its cultural development was that uh, the Muslim or the Muslim rulers or the Arab ru ru rulers they tolerated they, uh, their attitude towards the other religion and other cultures were that of a uh, that of a tolerant uh, ruler or a tolerant empire okay so they tolerated and they supported and they encouraged okay the other religious other religions and culture so this positive um, encouragement that others received this led to the development of science and scholarship okay and uh, and this kind of science and uh, technology and its development, this uh, happened not only within the Muslims. So that uh, happened within the Greeks and Hindus and Christians as well. So what, uh, it, uh, what it means is that the development of the Muslim culture were influenced by other cultures as well. Okay. So because it, uh, it because it, uh, in what because the Arab Empire was inspired by the other empires because of how it looked uh, upon the other other uh, other empire other kingdom and its culture and its history and its literature so all those influenced all those encouraged the development of culture of the Arab Empire okay Baghdad became one of the great centers of Muslim learning. Okay, the scholars gathered here and they were assigned to translate the works of Plato, Aristotle, Elis Euclid, etc., and other scholars and philosophers into Arabic. Okay, so this translation was not only about philosophy, but they were also about mathematical treatises. Okay, they were also about mathematical texts of Hindus. Okay, they were also about other religious texts. So all these texts which were brought from other parts of the world, from their neighboring rulers, from their neighboring empires, and they were uh, translated into Arabic. Okay, and these knowledge were then acquired by the Arabs. Okay, so the knowledge of employment of zero in the number series, the knowledge of algebra, the knowledge of numbers, etc. All these were learned by the Arabs through these kind of translating work. Okay, translation work. Now, uh, there was a madrasa or the center of learning uh, or, or a college of learning at Baghdad. And this was founded in 1213 AD. Now, this was a center of higher learning for students who had finished their elementary learning. Okay. These madrasas, now madrasas uh, were usually attached to mosques. They were right next to mosque or they were part of this mosque. OK, so as people uh, as people learned about the religious faith, they also at the same time learned about philosophies or uh, mathematics. So all kind of learnings were also encouraged and supported by the Arab emperors. OK. In the field of history, Ilm Khaldum. 
Khaldun made one of the most modern efforts to recapture the past by an examination of the evidence in sources of the past. So one of the important historians were uh, Khaldun. Okay, so Khaldun tried to learn about the past, look at the past by looking at the sources of this past. Okay, now Khaldun, of course, although his area of research, his interest was into looking at the past, but he did not limit his uh, interest or his work uh, into that. Okay, so he also wrote about religion. He also wrote about politics. Okay. And apart from that, he wrote about history, anthropology, sociology as well. Okay. Now, uh, the kind of methodologies that uh, Khaldun, uh, the way in which he looked at these topics, the way in which he looked at, say, for example, uh, reading and understanding or writing about the past. All right. These kind of methods and techniques were very high level of techniques and which were not used by the historians in Europe. OK, so historians like Khaldun uh, from the Arab Empire, they were much, much ahead in terms of how skilled they were in writing history. OK. In the field of philosophy, the Muslims, they revived the ideas of Aristotle. We know that they uh, translated the work of famous philosophers, okay, like Aristotle. And as a result of that, they revived the ideas of these philosophers. One of the profoundest of the Aristotelian scholar was Ibn Rashid. His impact on the European thought was through the Christian philosophers of Albertus, Magnus, and Thomas Aquinas, and through the Jewish philosopher Moses Malmonitz. Okay, so philosophers such as Ibn Rashid uh, in Arab, uh, from the Arab Empire, he was uh, influenced by philosophers such as Aristotle, uh, Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas, and that helped in his particular uh, study of, um, of Aristotelian methods and other areas of philosophy that he studied. Okay. Now, Arabic poets uh, studied all the known forms of poetry and produced some of the world's greatest love, nature, death, war, wisdom poets and ballads. Now, the Arab poets, they wrote poetry about all important themes which were quite common in the uh, in the world then okay so they wrote about love, nature, death, war, wisdom, etc. Okay. Al-Firdausi Al was one of the famous writer of the epics, okay? Like in India, we have epics like Ramayana, Mahabharata, right? So in a similar manner, Al-Firdausi was also one of the famous epic writers, all right? His book of kings centers about the exploits of the hero, Rustam, ranks with the Iliad and Enoid in the world literature. Okay, so his book uh, of the kings, it is one of the famous books, okay, that he has written. The other scholar, other writer, Omar Khayyam, is widely known through the English translation of Edward uh, Fitzgerald. Okay, so another important uh, writer of this period is Omar Khayyam, and his work has been well known to us uh, by uh, by Edward Fitzgerald, who is the trans who has translated his work. Okay. Omar Khayyam, uh, Khayyam's Rubaiyat provided many poets with both theme and form. His uh, his right his work Rubaiyat is very famous. Okay. Equally familiar to the literary world is the Arabian Nights. So he also wrote about Arabian Nights. Arabian Nights is the collection of fables, exploits and tales. It's about the stories, okay, tales, fables about the Arab world or the Arab Empire. It contains tales of Sinbad and the, uh, Sinbad the sailor and the account of Ali Baba and the 40 thieves. The Arabian Nights is a world renowned book. Now, the Arabian Nights, I don't know if uh, you have ever read it, but it's a very popular children's book. 
everybody uh, most of the children they read this book or if you just google it you'll uh, learn about it and uh, if you happen to come across this book read this book it's a very interesting book and i'm very sure you'll like it okay so this was also written by um, uh, a writer during this period okay the catalog of the Baghdad uh, bookseller is another uh, catalog or another book, Kitab Farisht. Il, uh, Ilan Nadim mentions a large number of books written in prose for moral education and amusement of readers. Okay, so Nadim wrote uh, uh, wrote for providing moral education and amusement to the readers. From the 9th century onward, the scope of literature writing expanded to include biographies, manuals of ethics, books on statecraft for the princes, and above all, history and geography. From 9th century onwards, these books not only included stories, tables, fables, but it also included uh, writings about history, geography, uh, about statecraft for the princess, for the rulers, and also about biographies and manuals of manuals of ethics. Okay. So these uh, books and history books, they are very important books. Why? Because they provide us information about the achievements of dynasties of uh, rulers of the uh, of their various methods of administrations or the administrative system. Okay, the tradition of local history writing developed with the breakup of caliphate. So with the breakup of caliphate, the tradition of uh, having a historian uh, be a part of the court, the king's, uh, the ruler's court and uh, write the, uh, the the history of the ruler, that tradition uh, was followed by the rulers after the breakup of the caliphate. Geography and travel books were also written during this period. So geography and travel books by travelers, by explorers were also written. So one of those travelers uh, was, one of those travelers were Al-Biruni. Okay, one of those travelers uh, was Al-Biruni and he wrote a famous book called Taqiq il Hind. Okay, and this basically means the history of India. So he traveled to India and he wrote about India. Okay, so this book tells us how the uh, how the people from the Arab Empire traveled and they reached to far distant land and how they viewed these lands, okay? How they viewed these lands which were beyond the Muslim world or which were beyond the world of Islam, all right? Now, uh, the caliphs or the caliphs or the rulers of the Arab Empire, one of the things that we have already learned that they were very supportive of the knowledge which, uh, which they came in contact, uh, literature, art, which they came in contact as they expanded and conquered more and more territories. And they would call these, uh, the scholars, the writers from these newly acquired territories or their neighboring kingdoms and empires into their court and have a discussion, okay? So the caliphs invited Indian scholars and physicians to Baghdad as well. They were impressed by their knowledge Okay, so the two great Hindu philosophical works, okay, uh, which uh, arrived in the, which arrived at uh, the uh, Arab Empire were Brahman Shputa and Khanda Kaya, uh, Kaya Ka of Brahma Gupta. So these two works of Brahma, Gu uh, Brahma Gu Gupta, they were brought to Baghdad. Okay, and they were translated into Arabic by Al Fazri. Okay, and this was commissioned, this was ordered by the ruler or Caliph Mansuf. Okay, apart from uh, Brahma Gupta's work, Aryabhat, Aryabhatta's work, another uh, important and great Indian philosopher, his works were also brought to Baghdad and translated into Arabic. Okay, so Aryabhatta's work on astronomy, okay, like Surya Siddhanta was also brought to the Arab Empire and translated into Arabic. All right. Now let us look at art and architecture. All right. Now the, uh, the Arab ru rulers, they built uh, 
important and beautiful religious buildings okay so they built mosques shrines tombs and these were built all across their empire from spain to central asia okay and these were symbols of islamic culture okay they spread these kind of culture so these had some basic designs and those designs were arches so these kind of these kind of arches were found or built in those um, monuments or those mosques okay there were also domes domes okay so domes are basically semicircular all right these kind of domes okay and minarets were also found so minarets are basically like towers towers okay so these kind of minarets were also found and open courtyards so they had open courtyards in the mosques uh, in the palaces all right so if you have seen uh, it's not exactly what uh, this chapter talks about but to give you just an example uh, Taj Mahal everyone has seen the picture if not in in real life right uh, so you see the the dome the minaret right and also there's an open courtyard like uh, the garden area so that kind of uh, those were some of the features similar features which the architecture of the arab empire also kind of featured okay now these kind of style they express the spiritual and practical needs of the muslims okay the muslim architecture it was a borrowed art it was borrowed okay it was not uh, invented by them it was predominantly influenced by the byzantine and persian architecture so the arab architecture was influenced by the byzantine and the persian architecture okay the mosques which they built they were places of worship okay their exteriors were slight and delicate the exteriors were decorated inscription uh, inscriptions appeared on these exteriors so they were very delicately uh, uh, laid out okay they were often topped by domes that moved okay these mosques were often topped by domes so if you uh, say for example imagine jama masjid in delhi right so jama masjid and most of the masjids they often have domes all right so imagine something like that so the uh, the places of worship or mosques they were often topped uh, by domes around some of the mosques were courtyards so some of the mosques had courtyards backyards garden areas all right and also arcades some mosques had minarets all right some mosques also had minaret you see the similar minarets in jama masjid as well from the top of which the muezzin called the faithful to the five prayers so at in these uh, minarets are put some um, uh, some uh, some uh, devices by which the uh, muezzin uh, who is in charge of calling giving uh, the call out for prayers so uh, say for example at the time of the uh, at the time of namaz or the evening prayer or, or the prayer right uh, the the call is given to the people so the people are aware and they start to pray in some areas the bulbous dome was replaced by a flat topped roof and praying such for a uh, and the praying arch for a horseshoe arch so in some places the dome was replaced by a flat surface and uh, the arch was replaced by a horseshoe arch all right so that kind of different uh, elements were found in the architecture now the muslim architecture produced five styles and they were the syro egyptian or arabic style the moorish or spanish style the persian style the indian style and the turkish style so these were all styles of the arab empire but as you can see they were all influenced by its surroundings wherever they went they adopted the neighboring or the existing uh, styles and the architecture developed 
developed as a result. Okay. Since Islam prohibited the carving and printing, painting of images, the interiors of the mosques had no pictures. So interior of the mosques have uh, or had no picture, but this did, did not prevent the Muslim artists from projecting the highly developed sense of beauty into architectural decoration involving many motifs, lattice work, uh, gilding and colored tiles. But this did not um, although use of pictures were not allowed in the mosques, but the architects, they used tiles, beautiful tiles, colored tiles, printed tiles and motifs into the mosques and other buildings. Okay. Let's look at the crafts. Now, the Muslim craftsmen or the craftsmanship uh, which emerged from the Arab Empire was that of highly skilled uh, craftsmanship. Okay, they made intricate designs of geometrical figures and they used these for the decoration of the walls, decoration or the patterns of the rugs that they weaved and tapestries. Okay. The Arabic language and its letter itself were used for beautiful decorative patterns. Okay, the Muslim craftsmen produced beautiful products in carved ivory, tooled leather, brass inlaid ware and carpets. So uh, the uh, craftsmen from the Arab Empire, they were famous for producing beautiful carved ivory work, leather, brass inlaid ware, right, and carpets, okay? Now let's look at uh, Khata T or calligraphy and arabesque, okay, or geometric designs. Now, um, the the rejections of or the Muslim culture uh, or Islam did not allow um, did not allow the representations of living beings, okay, in religious art. So because of that, they used different styles and techniques, and those were of two forms, and they were called calligraphy. Basically, it was beautiful writing uh, of the script, of the Arabic script, and the arabesque, which was geometrical designs and veg uh, vegetal, uh, vegetal designs, okay? So, these were the two forms which were used for decorations, carving purposes, all right? Calibra Calligraphic art has been best preserved in manuscripts of the Quran. So, if you look at the Quran, you can see the calligraphy, the the beautiful, uh, beautiful ways in which it has been written. So that kind of, uh, that kind of art, that kind of uh, skill was produced. Okay, literally works, literary works like Kitab al Afghani, Book of Songs, Kalila wa Dimna, and Makamat of Hairi were illustrated with, with beautiful miniature paintings. Now, apart from the a script, the beautiful handwriting of the Arabic letters, miniature paintings were also used in the books, okay? Small paintings, miniature are small tiny paintings of say for example plants, trees, whatever, okay? Besides this, a wide variety of illumination um, techniques were also used to enhance the beauty of books. Plant and floral designs based on the idea of garden were used in buildings and book illustrations. Okay, so different patterns of plants, different patterns of uh, floral designs or flowers, they were used in the books to enhance the beauty of the book and they were inspired by the idea of garden. They were inspired by the nature. Okay, so these kind of uh, designs, these kind of handwriting, these were part of the art of the Arab Empire. The third is the music. Okay, the next is the music. Um, now, Prophet Muhammad prohibited uh, instrumental music with the result that vocal music became the uh, chief form of music making. Now, Muslims, according to Islam, were prohibited to use uh, instruments, musical instruments. So as a result of this vocal music, singing songs, they, they became quite uh, popular. 
Okay, so in defiance of the Prophet's order, however, Muslims, despite the rules, the Muslims introduced uh, accompanied vocalization. Okay, they used the vocals. When this was accepted uh, by Islam, when it was all right for them to use uh, this kind of uh, skill for production of music, the Muslims turned to the production of many varieties of instruments of a company such as the lute, the harp, the tambourine, the flute, the reed pipe, the cymbal and many others. So these were all instruments which sort of produced uh, accompanied vocalization. Okay, so such music and production of such musical instruments and such sounds were also uh, introduced and were also done during this empire. Okay. Now the Arabs, they made much progress, okay, much progress in various fields of science as well, all right, from the beginning of the, uh, or by the beginning of the 10th century, they had already made progress and contributed to various, uh, uh, to the development of sciences, okay. Uh, they uh, made they made progress in researches in the field of geometry, in uh, in algebra, in geography, in astronomy, optics, chemistry, medicine, etc. Okay. So as a result of this, they were so uh, they were so advanced that they became leaders in the field of sciences. Okay. Some of the best stocked libraries and the leading scientific laboratories uh, were set up in the Arab Empire during this period. Okay. Now, the Arab science or the development of science was international. Now, what does it mean that um, people from various countries, uh, they also they also contributed to the development of the of the science or, or science and technology in uh, the Arab Empire. OK, because uh, the people from Arab, uh, the people from Arab Empire, they were free to work and settle down anywhere in the world they liked. And from those areas, the production of the knowledge, they all contributed to the development and growth of science. OK. In the field of astronomy, the Muslims accepted the current views on the relative positions of Earth and Sun. They added much to the knowledge of astronomy by constructing observatories in such centers as Baghdad, Cordova, and Damascus by improving astronomical instruments including the astro astro label and sextant in the field of astronomy also the arab uh, emperors they added or they um, made efforts to contribute to the knowledge of astronomy and for that they uh, established observatories and and uh, observatories and they improved uh, astronomical tools and instruments used for the study of astronomy in various parts of the um, of the empire now observatories the astronomical observatories were set up in baghdad in kartova and damascus okay now physics the, for the development of physics the arab empire had much to do with what they gained from the greeks okay so they took ideas and knowledge from greece okay from the greek philosophers right so from what the greeks had uh, been able to or was successful to develop the Arabs, they were uh, successful in adding to that, okay, in advancing the methods used by the Greeks or introduced by the Greeks, okay. So the Arabs carefully studied the law of gravity and prepared the way for Newton's career. That means the Arabs already studied or began a very careful study of the law of gravity, which later on helped uh, Newton to develop his um, idea of uh, gravity okay they also improved the greek knowledge of optics okay sight and perfecting and they perfected the uh, lens and mirrors and prisms how they all worked okay
In chemistry, the Muslim chemists were familiar with a considerable number of acids and they made use of arsenic and antimony. Okay, so the Muslims were also quite advanced in terms uh, in terms of the use of some uh, chemicals in terms of chemistry. Okay, they were familiar with such products such as alum, salt, ammoniac, mercury chloride, alcohol, and uh, others. Okay, so they were quite aware of the different substances already used in chemistry. The very fact that the word alchemy is of uh, the word alchemy is of Arabic origin shows how much the science of chemistry owes to the Muslim culture. So the word alchemy, which is used in chemistry, that word itself came from or originated from the Arab Empire. So that itself indicates how progressive in uh, the field of chemistry the Arab Empire was. Okay. Now, the Muslims applied their knowledge of chemistry both to theory and practice of medicine. So, the knowledge of uh, chemistry was applied in the production of medicine, not only in the production of medicine, but also in the practical applicability of the medicine. Okay, so they made a uh, they um, they made progress, remarkable progress in surgery, in operations. Okay, for example, Abul Qasis of Cordova performed extraordinary obstetrical and other major operations. Okay, more than that, he left to post posterity a full descriptions of instruments used by them. So the doctors uh, of this period, right, as they perform surgeries, they also kept a note, an account of their uh, of of their performances. Okay, so that has provided a large amount of knowledge of instruments, of his methods, of his theories. All right, the Muslims also advanced the knowledge of eye ailments. In terms of eye ailments, they were also quite advanced okay and they also studied the nature of the diseases related to eyes one of the physicians in egypt offered the following advice to the newcomers in his profession let's see what he said neglect not to visit and treat poor for there is no noble work than this comfort the sufferer by the promise of healing even when thou are not confident for thus thou may assist his natural powers, ask thy reward while the sickness is waxing or at its height. For being cured, he will surely forget thou did for him. So this was the message that this particular doctor uh, from Egypt uh, left for his, uh, for his uh, followers or for his successors. Okay. The caliphs provided huge amount of support and patronized these physicians without any description. Okay, so even if these doctors and physicians and philosophers belong to other religious faith or other clans, they were not discriminated because of that. Okay, Caliph Harun Rashid often consulted Hindu physicians and sent scholars to India to study medicine and sciences. One of the rulers, Khalif Harun Rashid, he, uh, he consulted Hindu physicians alongside the Muslim uh, physicians that he had in his empire and sometimes he sent his scholars to India to study medicine and sciences. Okay. So the main cause of such a remarkable growth of culture, science, civilization of the Arab Empire was the intellectuals, the philosophers, the scholars, the scientists, the historians. They enjoyed freedom and they were patronized, patronaged uh, and they received patronage from the ruler. They were supported. They were paid. They were looked after by the ruler. Okay. And they enjoyed freedom to conduct their work to practice their uh, learnings all right so because of that uh, um, there was major uh, growth and improvement and development of science technology art and architecture uh, and literature in uh, the Arab Empire okay after the 14th century however this uh, development of 
uh, science technology declined due to the political developments okay which affected the area the arab empire and also accounted to the growing orthodoxy which hampered the grow of growth of free thought but after 14th century there was a political upheaval in the empire okay um, and also with that what happened was uh, no such freedom was provided to the philosophers okay so the free thought was not encouraged and not supported by the rulers as a result of that the philosophers the intellectuals the scholars they could no longer practice and develop and um, enhance their learnings leading to the development of science technology art architecture and culture okay